Inshallah ta'ala. I wanted to say a few things about the importance of uh, learning language, especially in the wider context of scripture. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Inna anzalnahu Qur'anan arabiyan la'allakum ta'qilun. Indeed, we revealed it as an Arabic Qur'an in order for you to understand. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed the Qur'an and he revealed it in Arabic as an effective means by which we might understand his religion. Or more specifically, according to Imam al-Razi, his tawheed. Of course, the master science or the master discipline is theology. Knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no greater knowledge. And the most important principle of Islamic theology is tawheed, monotheism. So ultimately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specially chose Arabic as a means of revealing himself to humanity. Such is the status of Arabic in our tradition. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, Ta'alamu al-Arabiya fa'innaha min dinikum. Learn the Arabic language. For indeed, learning Arabic is from your religion. In another tradition related by Imam al-Bayhaqi, Sayyidina Umar said, radiallahu anhu, learn Arabic for it fortifies the aql and increases one in muru'ah. It fortifies or strengthens the intellect. It increases one in nobility and valor and virtue. Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he said, whoever learns Arabic, his disposition becomes gentle. He becomes a gentleman, or she becomes a lady, more civil, more studious, more intelligent, more contemplative. In other words, they begin to resemble the Arabian prophet, the prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was the most balighe and most fasih of the Arabs. He was the most eloquent and most rhetorically gifted of all the Arabs. And his beautiful and majestic words continue to echo throughout history, generation after generation. From a secular perspective, he's the most quoted human being in human history. He has to be because they attribute the Qur'an to him. So the Qur'an and the Hadith, he's easily the most quoted man in history, in addition to being the most praised human being who ever lived. You might say that Jesus, peace be upon him, is more praised. The problem is the vast majority of historians do not believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, ever claimed to be God. So praising Jesus as God is actually something that he himself would have repudiated. And according to the Quran, he will repudiate. But back to Arabic. As our president, Sheikh Hamza, may Allah protect him, has said, the Arabic language is the sine qua non of the Islamic tradition. In other words, it is the essential condition, the essential ala or tool through which we access our tradition at a deeper level. If someone doesn't know a word of Arabic, he could still adequately understand the basics of this religion in translation. That's the beauty of this religion. It's a universal religion. But scholarship and a more sophisticated engagement with our tradition requires knowledge of the Arabic language. Arabic is the key, miftah al-ulum. Reading the Qur'an in Arabic with understanding is a totally different experience than reading in translation. It's like looking at something in one or two dimension as opposed to three dimension. It's like watching a film on a 1970s 12-inch black and white television compared to watching the same film remastered on a movie screen in color in 3D. Same film, but a totally different experience. It's an experience of the divine. Reading the Qur'an in the very words chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with or without understanding, is a type of theophany. It's an experience of the divine. And we know that it is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to choose particular things from his general creation. يَخْتَصُ بِرَحْمِتِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ So from the universe made up of 10 to the 80 atoms, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose and exalted the human being, al-insan, Bani Adam, inni uh, ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. About 120 billion human beings he has chosen so far. From the Bani Adam, the human race, he chose al-anbiya, the prophets, 124,000. Some say only men, others say men and women. And from the prophets, he chose the rusul, the messengers, 313. From the messengers, he chose the five ulul azmi min al-rusul, the messengers of firm resolve. These are the ark apostles, if you will, like they're archangels, the chief apostles. Who are they? Nuh alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, and our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. And from these five, he chose as, has, as his beloved, 
his Habib, our Master Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the best of creation, Khayr al Khalqillah, Sayyidu Walali Adam, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was an Arab. He spoke Arabic. We did not send a messenger except that, uh, except that uh, in the language of his own people. So Allah chooses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Adam and Noah. He chose the house of Abraham and the house of Imran. And then from the house of Ibrahim alayhi salam, he chose Ismail alayhi salam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam said, Inna Allah astafa kinana. Kinana min waladi Ismail. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Kinana from the descendants of, uh, descendants of Ismail alayhi salam. Wastafa Qurayshan min Kinana. And he chose Quraysh from Kinana. Wastafa Hashiman min Quraysh. And he chose Hashim from Quraysh. Wastafa ni min Bani Hashim. And he chose me from the Hashemites. The chosen of the chosen of the chosen of the chosen of the chosen Al Mustafa. Al Mujtaba, Al Mukhtar, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam. And so the Quran, the final, the final revelation of God, was revealed in Arabic. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala chose the Arabic language. So Arabic is a sacred language. It's not an accident that if you rearrange the triliteral root letters of the word ilm, you get amal, action. Because a true alim, a true knower, puts his ilm into amal. A true knower puts his knowledge into practice. These terms are related. There are Jewish professors of Islamic studies all around the country, some of them with double PhDs, but these are not ulama. Why? They don't put their knowledge into practice. Rearrange the huruf once again, you get lama, light, luster, radiance, resplendence, brilliance. Ajib. Knowledge plus action equals light. Ilm plus amal equals lama. This is a sacred language. There are many examples like this. We have Arabic professor here, knows much more than I do. He can show you many of these things. And usually languages have a dhurwa, they have a peak or a pinnacle, or height of eloquence. So for English, it was the Elizabethan and Jacobian eras, the time of Shakespeare, who died in 1616, or the King James Bible of 1611, also called the Authorized Version. Both of these significantly influenced the English language more than any other texts. For Hebrew, it was probably the 10th century before the Common Era, the beginning of the Davidic dynasty. According to most, most critical scholars of the Bible, several passages of the Tanakh or Hebrew Bible were written during this period, like the creation story of Genesis chapter 2 and probably many of the Psalms. For Greek, it was the time period known as Archaic Greece, the Odyssey, the Iliad, the Theogony, so the ancient pre-pre-Socratic poets, Homer and Hesiod, but also later writers of the classical Greek period like Herodotus and Plato, the standard Greek curriculum at the time of the composition of the New Testament in the first century CE included the works of Homer and Herodotus. So the educated Koine Greek writers of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as well as educated Hellenized Jews of the period, such as Philo of Alexandria and Paul of Tarsus, would have read and studied Homer and Herodotus and very likely Plato and Aristotle. For Arabic, it was the Hejaz in the late antique especially the 6th and 7th centuries of the Common Era. That was the peak of their language, the flourishing of the Shu'ara. This was a time in the Qur'an. And as I said in the last khutbah, the Qur'an remains to this day the gold standard of Arabic literature. It remains an unclassifiable, sui generis Arabic text, a one-of-a-kind and totally unique and inimitable masterpiece. Nothing comes close to its eloquence, style, and exceptional impact upon humanity. It is a mu'ajiza khalida. It is an everlastingly incapacitating phenomenon for anyone who attempts to imitate or surpass it. Professor Muhammad Abdul Halim, he said, one overriding objective of the Quran is to speak with penetrating words. So I want to give you a few basic but specific examples of how the Quran makes this amazing impression upon the listener. <clears throat> the Quran is an ocean of rhetoric. In a final research paper, uh, for one of your classes, you might use one or two rhetorical devices and feel pretty good about yourself. The Quran is an ocean of rhetoric. One such rhetorical device is called iltifat, or sudden change. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ We see you turning your face to the sky. فَلَا نُوَلِّيَنَّكَ قِبْلَةً تَرْضَاهَا So we will, turn, we will turn you towards a qibla that pleases you. 
Subhanallah, the Prophet ﷺ looked at the sky with a request in his heart. The sama is the qibla of dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the prayer qibla to please his Habib ﷺ. Fawalli wajhaka shatr al masjid al haram. So turn, fawalli, singular, wajhaka, kaful khitab, singular. Turn your face toward the inviolable mosque. Then without skipping a beat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَحَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُمْ فَوَلُّوا وَجُوهَكُمْ شَطْرًا So wherever you all are, turn your faces toward it. You see what happened? Sudden change. Allah went from addressing the singular to the plural, from the Nabi to the nation. Why? According to the ulama to highlight the close intimate relationship between the Prophet sallallahu and his ummah. So not only does this ayah demonstrate the closeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Allah changed the prayer qibla to please his habib. But it demonstrates the closeness of the messenger to us that we are mentioned in the same divine breath as it were with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa We also find iltifat in the fatiha along with another powerful rhetorical literary characteristic uh, of the Quran known as syntactical variants in the same ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, maliki yawm din So far, the abd is praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the third person. He's speaking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then suddenly, iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'een. Now the abd is speaking directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not simply, na'buduka wa nasta'eenuka, but iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'een. So not only do we have iltifat, we have the direct object or object pronoun fronted for emphasis and restriction, the consequence of which is a theological reformation. So that from this ayah, we move from a pre-Islamic jahali, henotheism, to a restorative Abrahamic monotheism. Because if it said, na'buduka wa nasta'inuka, the pre-Islamic Arabs would have said, yes, we also worship Allah and ask Him for help. But iyyaka na'budu, only you, Ya Allah, do we offer ibadah. Wa iyyaka nasta'in. And with only you, Ya Allah, do we practice isti'ana. True monotheism, restored by such a powerful and impactful use of language. A statement that we recite in every unit of prayer at least 17 times a day. Think about that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to make tadabbur of the Quran. The Quran also employs ellipsis as a method of making an in- impact. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَذَّبَتْ ثَمُودُ بِتَغْوَاهَا The Thamud denied or belied out of arrogance. Denied what? Belied what? The verb is transitive, but the object is not mentioned. It is elided. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the audience to think about its meanings, to ponder upon its discourse. When the Quraysh in Mecca heard this verse about the Thamud, their minds would have filled in the blank. What is the conceptual direct object? What or who did the Thamud deny? Their messenger. Oh, that's what we're doing. They would have said. They should have said. The Quran forces us to think about its discourse. Another type of syntactical variance is the fronted predicate in a declarative sentence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرْيَمْ قُلْ فَمَا يَمْلِكُ مِنَ اللَّهِ شَيْئًا إِنْ أَرَادَ يُهْلِكَ الْمَسِيحَ بْنُ مَرْيَمْ وَأُمَّهُ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا وَلِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَ يَخْلُكُ مَا يَشَاء وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ So after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repudiates the divinity of Isa alayhi salam, he gives us a declarative sentence in which the predicate is fronted to communicate absolute exclusivity. وَلِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ to Allah alone belongs the dominion, the kingdom, the sovereignty of the universe, the cosmos. The phrase, the heavens and the earth and all between is a Semitic expression that denotes the cosmos. It's also found in the Hebrew Bible. The sovereignty, the supreme power and authority of all creation only belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody else, not Isa alayhi salam, nobody else. This is the import of the sentence. The syntax itself teaches us something about Christian theology about what Christians believe before repudiating it. The syntax of the Qur'an teaches us something about Christian theology. This is amazing. So obviously, knowledge of the Arabic language 
enriches our understandings of the Qur'an. I would also argue that knowledge of the languages of Ahl al-Kitab also enrich our understandings of the Qur'an. That knowledge of biblical linguistics give us the ability to nuance some of the ayat of the Qur'an and even defend the Qur'an against the attacks of polemicists. So this is related to something called apologetics, which does not mean you apologize for being a Muslim. This is a branch of theology that seeks to defend the religion from attacks. It comes from apologia, which literally means to speak away, to speak away objections, to speak away the shubuhat. And it seems to me that it's important, especially for us as Muslims in the West, to have a broader understanding of Judeo-Christian tradition and history, because the Qur'an has something to say about that tradition and history. I'll give you an example with respect to our Christology. What is Christology? Christology means the study of Christ, the Messiah. The word Christ comes from the Greek Christos, which is a literal translation of the Hebrew Mashiach, meaning the anointed one. In the Qur'an, one of the titles of Isa alayhi salam is Al-Masih, the Christ, the Messiah. I remember once after a lecture Several years ago, a couple of sisters approached me and said, they were very concerned, and they advised me never again to say the word Christ when referring to Isa alayhi salam. So I said, why not? And they said, oh, you don't know. You should know this. The word Christ comes from crucified. So I pointed out to them that the word Christ is from Greek, crucified is from Latin. Anyway, they're not actually related. Now, a question we get all the time from non-Muslims, at least I get all the time, is the following. What do you mean as a Muslim when you say Jesus is the Messiah? You see, many people think the word Messiah is synonymous with God or a divine savior. Other people think the word Messiah must denote some sort of political office, military leader or king. So this is where a broader religious and linguistic literacy will help us compellingly articulate and defend our beliefs. How so? Well, in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible, in the scriptures of Bani Israel, there are three types of messiahs. Three types of people are, are called messiah, kings, priests, and prophets. So the title messiah is an honorific title, which denotes being chosen or highlighted by God. When you anoint something, you highlight or illuminate it. When I make mas'ha over my head during wudu, I'm anointing my head with water. The Prophet Sallallahu said that he saw Isa Alayhi in a vision circumambulating the Kaaba. And his head was dripping with water. So there are king messiahs, priest messiahs, and prophet messiahs. Among the Israelites, the king messiahs were descendants of David. The priest messiahs were descendants of Aaron. But Isa Alayhi was neither. Tribe is taken from the father. And Isa alayhi salam did not have a father. He's neither Davidic nor Aaronite. So what is he? Inni Abdullah, atani al-kitaba, wa ja'alani nabiyya. So he was a prophet messiah. What's the textual evidence for prophet messiah? In the King James Version of the Bible, the most popular Bible translation in the world, Psalm 105.15, sounds like this. Touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. So on the surface, the verse seems to say that there's one anointed, one Messiah, and then there are the prophets who are mentioned as a separate and distinct category. One Messiah and many prophets. Touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. Two distinct categories. So it seems. But English is not the language of the tehillim, of the Psalms. It's Hebrew. Meanings can be manipulated with translations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَإِنَّ مِنْهُمْ لَفَرِيقًا يَلْوُونَ أَلْسِنَتَهُمْ بِالْكِتَابِ It's a very uh, ajib ayah. And there's a section from the people of the book who twist, their tongues around, uh, who twist their tongues about the scripture. Now, lisan means language in Qur'anic Arabic. Also in biblical Hebrew. The phrase, the, the, the Jews refer to the Arabic language as لَيْشَانْ قَيْدَرْ لِسَانُ قَيْدَرْ The tongue of Kedar, one of the sons of Ismail alayhi salam. They twist their translations with respect to their scripture, i.e. Bible. kitab, So that you might think it's part of the Bible or the scripture. kitab, But it's not part of the scripture. And they say, this is from Allah. But it is not from Allah. They utter a lie against Allah. And they know it. It's amazing. The Quran is so perfect, so succinct. Allahu Akbar. And we know every tarjama. 
is in reality a tafsir. So what does the original Hebrew of Psalm 105.15 say? It says, Al tig'u bi mashikhai bi navi'ai al tare'u. Do not touch my anointed ones, plural, my messiahs, plural. Do not harm my prophets. So this is called a bi-member segment in synonymic parallelism. If, you don't know, if you've heard that before, we, we touch this. There's a section in Ulum al-Quran where we get into this. It's very common in Semitic rhetoric, especially Hebrew lyrical poetry, especially in Psalms and Proverbs. In other words, the second line is just a restatement of the first line. Like Proverbs 16.8, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. You see, it's, it's, it's saying the same thing. It's, a, it's like if I say to my wife, I love you so much. I adore you intensely. The second member or line, I adore you intensely, is just another way of saying, I love you so much. It's synonymic parallelism. So do not touch my anointed ones, plural. In other words, do not harm my prophets. So you see in this verse, the prophets are the anointed ones. The Mashiachim are the Nevi'im. And Isa alayhi salam is a prophet Messiah. And he is the prophet Messiah. Par excellence. Why? Because he announced the coming of our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This is the essence of the good news. The gospel. Gospel means good news. This is the essence of the Injil. The Evangelion that he brought. How do you say gospel in Hebrew? Bisar. The cognate is Bushra. Wambubashiran. And to give you good news. And to give you the gospel. Bi Rasulin of a messenger. Ya'ati min ba'di. Of a messenger who's coming after me. Ismuhu Ahmad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <clears throat> Let me give you another example. I found Muslim literacy of the broader, quote, Abrahamic tradition can nuance the Quran and clarify our beliefs in the face of detractors. So there are some modern critics, be they Ahlul Kitab or atheists, who attack the Christology of the Quran. Right? These critics and polemicists claim that the Quran is sort of a mishmash of various Christian opinions about Jesus, peace be upon him, without any real consistency. And obviously, again, for them, the author of the Qur'an is the Prophet ﷺ. Now, in the Qur'an, Isa salam is called the Word of God. So these critics point out that while the Prophet ﷺ denied the divinity of Jesus in the Qur'an, he also called Jesus the Logos. And in John's Gospel, the Logos is God. N-R-K, ain ha lagos In the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And the Logos was with God. And the Logos was God. John 1.1. Now again, the vast majority of historians maintain that it is highly implausible that the historical Jesus of Nazareth, peace be upon him, believed himself to be divine in any way. And while the Quran does correctly deny the divinity of Jesus, it seemingly accidentally referred to Jesus as the Logos, the Word of God. And so the Quran is also saying something uh, implausible here about Jesus. In other words, the Quran is cons- inconsistent in its Christology. This is the argument. So how do we respond to this? Is the Qur'an affirming that Jesus, peace be upon him, is the logos of John's gospel? So here again, a little knowledge of biblical languages and broader religious history will help us defend the Qur'an. And by the way, issues like this are causing some Muslims to leave the millah. They can't solve them. Education is key. So when the Qur'an says Jesus is a word from God, right? Kalimatun min Allah. It is the angel who announces this to Maryam alayhi salam. So Jesus' title, word from God or word of God, is related to his miraculous birth. So that's number one. It has nothing to do with his supposed hypostatic or personal pre-eternality. And this is significant because I would argue that the Quran here is not borrowing a middle platonic term or concept uh, like the Gospel of John apparently does. But rather the Quran is continuing the established Jewish miracle birth literary tradition. The established Jewish miracle birth literary tradition. How so? Well, in the book of Genesis, 1814, Sarah laughs and says, How shall I have a child when I am old? Or in the Quran, Ya wa ajuzun wa in ajib. But what did the angel say to Sarah in Genesis in the Torah? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? But that's English. That's a translation. In Hebrew, it says, 
Hayipala'il, may Adonai davar. Literally, is any word too hard for the Lord? Davar means word, kalima. In Greek, this is translated as chrema, not lagos. But what does davar mean in the context of Genesis? It means an edict, a matter, or a decree. So what are the angels actually saying to Sarah? Is anything that God decrees, is any affair that God wills too hard for him to do? This is, this is the meaning. In fact, Wilhelm Jesenius, in his famous uh, lexicon, says that one of the words in Arabic that is equivalent in meaning to davar is amr, ata'jabina bin amrillah, as the angels say to Sarah in the Quran. Do you wonder at the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay, so in the Quran, when the angel says to Mary, inna allaha yubashiruki bi kalimatin minhu, God gives you glad tidings of a word, a davar from him. In the Jewish context, the first century Jerusalem, how would Mary have understood this? In the Jewish context, the first century Jerusalem, how would Maryam alayhi salam would have understood this? Context is king. Mary would have understood this as God decreeing some weighty affair, some important matter for her. Because Mary knew the Torah. When Maryam alayhi salam says to the angel that no man has touched her, the angel says, إِذَا قَضَىٰ أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا يَقُولُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ Whenever God decrees a matter, an amr, an affair, a davar, a khrema, he says to it, be and it is. So Jesus, peace be upon him, is that davar, that khrema, that amr, that kalima. So amr and kalima are basically in the Quranic discourse regarding Jesus, peace be upon him, synonymous. They parallel each other. Or in Surah Maryam, the angel says to Mary, وَكَانَ أَمْرًا مَقْضِيًّا it was a matter decreed. In other words, it was a word decreed. So the Quran tells us how it's using the word kalima with respect to Jesus, peace be upon him. Not in the Greek henotheistic Johannine sense, but in the contextually proper monotheistic Jewish sense. So a word of God means something that God decreed. So the Quran's epithet for Isa salam, a word of God, is not at all equivalent to the Johannine Lagos but rather the Tanakhi Davar, translated Chrema in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Here's another Christological example. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that Isa alayhi salam was aided with the Holy Spirit. So here the critics claim again that the Quran is affirming a Trinitarian idea while also denying the divinity of Jesus. The Qur'an is confused again, they say. But the truth is, the Qur'an is not confused. The critics are confused. If Isa alayhi salam said in the first century that he was being aided by Ru'ah Kadosh, by Ruh al-Qudus, what did he mean? Context is king. Did he mean the third person of a triune deity? Did the Jews in the first century, Palestine, believe in the divinity of the Holy Spirit and thus the Trinity? I would say no, that's an anachronism. The phrase Ru'ach Kudosh is used several times in the Tanakh, once in the Psalms and a couple of times in Isaiah. So Psalm 5111, it says, Do not cast me away from your presence, nor take away from me Ru'ach Kudoshoka, your Holy Spirit. And this again is a bi-member segment in, in parallelism. The second line is just a restatement of the first line. Do not cast away from me your presence. Do not take away from me your Holy Spirit. So then the phrase Ru'ach Kadosh is an expression that denotes the presence of God's power. It denotes the presence of God's power by which he accomplishes his divine will. Now the presence of God's power can certainly become manifest in the form of an angel. In fact, in Psalm 89, the angels are called Qudushim, the holy ones or the holy spirits. So again, just as we saw with Jesus, peace be upon him, being a word from God, a davarmi adonai, a kalimatum min Allah, the Quran also restores and reinstates the true meaning of the Hebrew phrase ruach kodosh, purifying it of its shirk. It uses it properly according to its context as both a way of clarifying our Christology and correcting the errors made by Ahlil Kitab. The key to all of this is language. The key to all of this is language. Study language. Learn Arabic. It is from your deen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fastaghfiru innahu huwa al-ghafur rahim Tubu ila Allah ya tawab tubu alayna.